Titus 2. <laughs> I saw Tommy's eyes go up into the corner of his head. Titus is going to be in the New Testament way up toward the very back. <laughs> Titus 2, beginning at verse 11. We're going to simply read tonight through verse 14. I want to talk to us on the topic of until he comes. Titus 2:11 through verse 14, standing in honor of the reading of God's word. The King James text reads, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. How many of us believe that? Amen. I believe that. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What do you know, Mary? Titus has got God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, as the same person, had not he? All right? who gave himself, singular, not plural, for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Well, a lot of us qualify for that. I don't know many that are any more peculiar. <laughs> Zealous of good works. Amen. Master, we thank you, God, tonight for every opportunity that we have to come into the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, tonight that we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and we're going to celebrate the coming of our King. For, Lord, in, in uh, looking at these elements and realizing what they represent to us, they're also a reminder not only of what you did, but, Lord, they're a reminder of the fact that you're soon to return. Master, tonight, anoint your messenger. Anoint those that hear that they might receive the Word of God and graft it into their hearts. Grant it tonight, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. So here we have Titus telling us that the blessed hope of the church, you know, the greatest hope we have is looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And if you want to talk about historically people making real ducks out of themselves, it's usually been around the second coming of the Lord Jesus. You know, a lot of people have made some big fools out of themselves relative to the second coming of the Lord. About every time you turn around, somebody's publishing another book saying that they've got a theory when it's going to happen, when it's going to take place, even though the Lord himself said, it is not for you to know the hour. It is not for you to know the time. The, the reality that Jesus is coming is what's important. When he gets here, it doesn't matter. Because Paul said, whether we're living or dead, either way we're going up. So it doesn't matter whether he gets here, Mary, before I pass or not. The fact of this is, is when he gets here, I want to be ready to go. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 21, the word of the Lord declares, Wherefore, there, uh, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, Yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, Paul says, meaning, in other words, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and he hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Hallelujah. What a wonderful 
transaction that transpired. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God allowed the sacrifice that he personally created to become sin. It doesn't say that he allowed it to become a sacrifice for sin. He said he made it to become sin. For he hath made him to be sin for us. On the cross of Calvary, the body of the Lord literally, like a sponge, absorbed the sins of the world. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. Whether you're a believer tonight or you're not, whether you're someone who looks at uh, the Christian faith and scoffs it, or whether you're someone who looks at it and, and weeps because you embrace it and believe it, the reality tonight, my friend, is Jesus Christ died for everybody. He's already paid the price for every single soul that will ever be born onto this planet. And the reality tonight is simply this. He did not become sin uh, just for those who would believe, but he became sin for the entire world. You know, it's funny when you pay a price for something and you know that the majority of what you're paying for, you're never going to see. You know what I'm saying? And that's what God did. He paid a price for something and knew that 90% of it he'll never get a return. But he paid the price for everyone. Because in a free, uh, with, within the context of a free will and a free mind, every individual has the opportunity to embrace this gospel. Every individual has the opportunity to grasp hold of this gospel. God doesn't say, well, let's see, I'm going to set it up so that you're going to be saved, but you aren't. No. He said, I paid the price for everybody. This way, those that grab hold of it have it. And those that don't, oh, well. So I lose out a little. So I paid a little extra. You understand what I'm saying tonight? Amen. You know, the Word of God tells us in Hebrews 1, verses 4 through 14, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained the more excellent name than they. This is talking about the man Jesus Christ. This is talking about his present state of existence in what we often refer to as a glorified body. He's being made better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance, meaning he earned it. The angels were merely created to do a job, and they do it. Jesus has a greater uh, place than the angels because he inherited that. He earned it. It wasn't something that was just given to him. He earned it. it the Word of God goes on to say, uh, As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for unto which of the angels said he at any time? Thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. Under which, under which of the angels did he have been? You see, he's asking a rhetorical question here. Well, this should answer a lot of knuckleheads' questions about whether Michael was involved in, in the Lord, in being Jesus, or Gabriel, or Lucifer, or anybody else. It didn't happen. Because Paul right here is saying very, 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 very plainly, under which of the angels did he ever say this? He did. Okay? Now listen. Under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. That includes Michael. That includes Gabriel. Let all the angels of God worship him. He couldn't have been an angel, because if he'd have been an angel, he certainly couldn't have worshipped himself. But he was not an angel. And the angels were called upon to worship him by divine command. And listen now to this. Uh, and, and of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his and his ministers a flame of fire but unto the son he saith so see this he says this is what they say to the angels but this is what he says to the son unto the son he saith 
Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Did you hear it? Did you catch it? Unto the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Hallelujah. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hand. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same. And thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make mine enemy thy footstool? Again he asked that same rhetorical question. And then he says, Are they not all? All who? Angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? So Paul says, He couldn't possibly have made an angel. Jesus, because the purpose and nature of angels is to minister on behalf of the people of God. That's their job. They're ministering spirits that God uses and sends them forth to minister on his behalf to the people of God. He said it wouldn't fall within their functionality. It, that wouldn't be what an angel does. An angel, that it's not within an angel's capability to serve as a redeeming sacrifice. It's not, it's not even close to what they're designed to do, so to speak, okay? By the way, tonight this is uh, almost more on the line of a Bible study than a message. And there's a reason. I'm going to bring it around in a minute, I promise you. So then we see in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 through 16, the Apostle Paul writes, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. So he was made a little lower than the angels, just as man is, in an effort so that he would be able to die, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Remember what I said? He didn't die for those of us that believe. He died for even those that don't believe. That he should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things? Let me ask you a question. What does the Word of God say that all things are made for? They're made for God's pleasure. The Bible says, and for thy pleasure they were created. And he's saying here, for it became him for whom are all things. All things are for God. And by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation, which is Jesus, perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth, listen carefully now to this next statement, for, he that, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So the one that sanctifies is the Lord Jesus Christ. But because he took on our nature, it's, he's part of our family. He's, he's not of a different sort, or he's not of a different nature than we. He, he's, he's after the same nature as we are. Therefore, he is the firstborn. He is the first born again, so to speak. He is the first to be born in the resurrection. Okay? So let me see if we, we can go in a little bit further here. Uh, for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him and again, Behold, I am the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself 
likewise took part of the same. Children are flesh and blood. We're flesh and blood. Therefore, he also likewise took part of the same. He took on the same identical thing. Uh, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You know, there are people that live their whole lives terrified of death, and they live a life of bondage because they're terrified at every moment that one day they're going to die. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Well, why would he take on the nature of why, why would it even be a question if he wasn't to begin with? Why would he say he didn't take on the nature of angels? Well, of course he didn't, because it was an angel to begin with. If that were true. You following my line of logic here? Okay, now... I want to move a little bit into something slightly different here now. Reading from Matthew 24, I'm going to read a pretty good hunk, pretty good chunk. I want you to listen real carefully. You're going to say, Brother Mark, where in the world? Because this is like from a whole different place. That was all, I just kind of laying a little bit of groundwork there. Okay? Kind of heavy. Now, I want to get into something. Because you remember, tonight is the communion service. So all these scriptures that I've been reading you, I'm trying to help you put into context the elements and what they represent. I'm trying to help you understand that the Lord himself took on human form, flesh and blood. And, G and the Word of God tells us, uh, Jesus says that the bread that he offered, he said, is my flesh. He didn't say it's my life, which I lay down for you. No. He said, it's my flesh which is given for you. Well, what's the difference? Well, it's easy. Because when you understand that a human being has a trifold nature, and you understand that his flesh was the only aspect of himself that was human, but it was perfect human because of the spirit and soul that dwelled within, and you understand that God himself, like I did in one Christmas there, when I used that illustration with the rope, God himself robed himself in a flesh and blood person, which was the Lord Jesus Christ. He just put on that rope because that robe was all that could be offered on Calvary. That robe was all that could be hung on the tree. You couldn't have nailed God to the tree. wouldn't have worked. <laughs> Amen. The nails wouldn't have held him. But he had to, in order for it to be at all possible, he had to take on that humanity. He had to take on that flesh and blood so that he then could allow his flesh. You couldn't kill, you couldn't kill God if you wanted to, but you could kill the flesh. All right, now, let's, now we're going to move into a little bit different thing. Matthew 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. He's prophesying of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which happened uh, just 70 years or so after the Lord had ascended. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us. What shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. You know, folks, there are a lot of deceivers out there. There are a lot of deceivers. The devil has been in a mad rush deceiving from the very first day that the Lord ascended. You know, we read in Scripture oftentimes of the last days, and one of the mistakes that a lot of people make, that a lot of organizations and groups and churches make when they're trying to define the signs of the Lord's coming, one of the mistakes that they make is, God doesn't look at time the way we look at time. When He speaks of the end times, do you know when the end times began? 
According to the Jehovah's, it started in 1914, or it started in this year or that year, 19, uh, 1874. No, that's not when the end times began. The end times began the minute Jesus was lifted off of planet Earth and ascended into heaven. Because from that minute, the Earth was winding down. The clock was going backwards. Things were getting ready for the culmination of all things. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? The end times began the day that Jesus ascended. So there are prophecies that we read where the Lord speaks of the end times. And some of those things happened 2,000 years ago. And some of them happened yesterday. Because the end times started when he ascended and they'll end when he comes back for his church. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And that's why folks get so confused when they try to interpret Scripture and they try to pinpoint the time as to when the Lord's coming because they get all caught up in the language. End times. Ooh, the end times. Well, so what that's saying is that this is going to happen at the very, very, very tip of the end. Sweetheart, 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago is yesterday to God. The Bible does tell us. A thousand years is as a day, and a day is a thousand years. God's time, his, his frame of, of, of thought relative to time is so completely different than ours. So when he says this is going to happen in the end time, that these things are going to happen in the end time, if you understand that the end times began at the ascension and will culminate when all this is brought to a head, then when you read Scripture and you read all these different prophecies relative to the end time, it makes sense because, aha, wait a minute, that's right, because this happened a thousand years ago. Aha, yes, this happened 400 years ago. Aha, this happened 200. You, you see what I'm saying? If you remember there, that the Apostle Paul said, um, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, so on and so forth, right? But we also read in Paul's writing that one of the signs of the last days was that they would forbid to marry. Do you remember that? Do you remember reading that? Well, gee, the Roman Catholic Church did exactly that and has forbid its priesthood from marrying for many, 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 many years now, right? And you say... Well, that's true. The Roman Catholic Church forbids folks to marry. Yeah, that would fall into the category of what the Lord was saying. Yeah, but I got news for you. There's more. There's more. There's another organization on planet Earth that, just like the Roman Catholic Church says, you can't possibly find God without us. And if you try, you're going to be annihilated. And this organization, just like the Roman Catholic Church, the priests, you know, partake of the wine at communion, and all the let the poor little sinners and the few have is the cracker, right? Well, this organization has a chosen few who, when they have communion services, I'm talking about out of the entire organization, which is three or four million people worldwide, they have less than 2,000 people who they say are qualified to partake of communion. Isn't that interesting? Just like Mother Rome. Looks a lot like Mom, don't she? But let me tell you something else about this organization. This organization went out of its way to proclaim that the world was going to come to a climactic end and Armageddon was going to hit and everything was going to change. And they prophesied for a decade that this was going to happen in 1914. It didn't happen. All of a sudden they said, Oops, well, we figured out our mistakes. We, we kind of made a miscalculation. So, no, he's, it's going to happen in 1925. But they did. 1925 came. It didn't happen. All of a sudden it was, Well, we just kind of had to tweak our figures. And, of course, people are foolish enough to keep following them and keep going along. 1925, nothing happened. All of a sudden it was 1975. The Lord's going to come in 1975. But you know what? This is the sad part. This isn't even funny. As 1975 rolled around, some of the people in that organization sold their homes, 
sold their businesses, left their jobs, retired, did all kinds of things that were not beneficial to them financially and whatever, you know, totally got, I mean, sold their future right down the drain. All because their organization that they trusted in told them 1975 was definitely the year. And people were too stupid, I'm sorry to say it that way, to look back and say, you know what, you told us 1914 was the year, you told us 1925 was the year, it didn't happen either one of them times, so why should I trust you now? But let me tell you something else that you may not know. This organization also published articles encouraging people not to marry. Because after all, if you marry, then you won't have the time and the, the ability to devote yourself to the kingdom work. And do you know how many thousands of people in that group did not marry? Because they thought the world was coming to a culmination. And, and the organization said it's going to happen in 1975. You know, many, many thousands did not marry. So you see, a lot of the prophecies that we see in Scripture concerning the last days, we, if we're not privy to the information, we don't even realize that it's being fulfilled in many different places. It's happening in many different places, in many different ways. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so we've got to understand today that, let me tell you, like one preacher said, Brother Magruder says, you can slip daylight past the rooster quicker than you can uh, get the rapture past God's people. All right? He's going to come. The Lord's going to come. But listen now what the Lord said. I'm talking, I, I went through all of that because I'm talking about the fact that, folks, Satan is in the business of deceiving. He, that, that's what he does full time. He don't have a part time job at Carvel. He full time deceives. That's all he does. And if he can deceive your soul and convince you of a lie, he'll do it. And there are many out there today, and you've got to watch yourself. Don't get caught up in this foolishness of, of people saying, well, I have this theory, the Lord's going to come in 2012 because da 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 Who cares? Listen, the Lord can come in 2012. He can come in 4012. I'm going to work until I die or until he comes what? There's too much work to be done. I don't have to worry about what day and what hour. Like the old song says, wait a little longer, please, Jesus. There are so many wandering yet in sin. Oh, God, sometimes you want to pray, God, please don't come today. Please don't come tomorrow. I know people that need to be saved. I know people that need to know you. Oh, God, give them another opportunity. Give them another day. Give them another chance. Amen. Now, listen, he said, talking about the signs of the end of the world, and Jesus answered, saying unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Or many shall come in my name, saying, I represent Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. They shall then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Mary, when's the last time you got afflicted and delivered up to be beaten in a synagogue? It's been a while, hadn't it? See, I love churches want to preach, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, and, and they want to act like these prophecies are going to go unfulfilled, and the Lord's going to come. And Jesus said not one word will go unfulfilled. He said not one jot nor tittle is going to go unfulfilled. Everything it says is going to happen. And we want the easy message. We want the soft message. You know, we like the idea of, oh, the Lord's coming, hallelujah, going to be raptured out of here, glory to God. 
But the Lord says, before that happens, you're going to be afflicted. You're going to be taken up for my name's sake, and you'll be hated of all men. Oh, my Lord. That's a different ball of wax, Mary, isn't it? All of a sudden, all of a sudden we're not sure, Mom, if we want to if we want to stay in this race. I look at folks sometimes that, like Mount Dorothy and Uncle Travis, you know, they're up there in their years a bit, and I think to myself, God, you are so merciful, because they'll be out of here before the storm. You hear me? Some of us in this room tonight may be out of here before the storm. Thank God. Amen. Thank God. You'll be shouting around the throne. Come on now. You'll be dancing in the presence of Jesus, honey. And all the trouble that hits down here will be so far removed from you that you're not even going to know it's happening. I'll tell you, in, in today's world, I would say to you, seriously, it's not a time to be afraid of death. It's a time to say, Lord, when it's my time to go, take me on, because I know that there's a storm of brewing on the horizon. Amen. And I don't necessarily care to be here. Because the next hurricane, Katrina, that hits may be ten times worse. And now I'm afraid that I made that statement because <laughs> sometimes I preach things and lo and behold, that's exactly what happens. So uh, it kind of makes me a little bit nervous. Anyway, uh, all these are the beginning of sorrow. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise. You hear me now? Many. He didn't say, and a few false prophets will pop on the scene. He said, many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. You know, during the course of the uh, mid 1800s, in the middle of the 1800s, there was a sudden bust of cult right now. What we would classify today as a cult, but they they all started in the same time frame. They all start every single time on the same premise. All churches are wrong. All churches are bad. All churches are after nothing but money. Yeah, look at me here in my little tiny cathedral. And if, if you haven't seen my Cadillac, come look at it. And if you want to see my beautiful 14-room mansion that I live in, you just come and I'll, I'll let you visit it. You see, because there are some preachers like this old boy here who preaches this message because I believe it. And if I ever see a dime or a dollar, I don't care. As long as the church's bills are paid, I'm happy. Amen. So don't tell me that that's a crock of nonsense and a cop-out is what it is. But that is a deceit that the enemy uses in order to turn people away from the truth and to, to separate them so that he can sell them a lie. And the Lord said, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see... Now listen, now he's given us a very specific event to look for. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field turn back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to those that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Do you know who the elect are in this Israel. 
Israel like the base of short because during the tribulation Israel is going to be number one target, number one enemy. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophet, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they well they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. So the Lord saying, Listen, I've given you advance warning. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Aha, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know a false prophet that tells me. I know one outfit that tries to tell me that ever since the 17, late 1700s that the presence of Christ has been in the world ruling with 144,000 uh, assistant rulers and they say that he's ruling the earth but he's invisible, he's not seen he's here, he's doing, he's bringing the world under his power and under his control slowly but surely but he's just invisible, he's not seen oh I see, so basically what you're saying to me is he's in a secret chamber Hello? Isn't that what they're saying? Tommy, isn't that what they're saying? They're saying he's in a secret place. You know, you can't get to him. You can't see him. But he's there. He's here. He's back in earth. The Lord says they're going to tell you that I'm here and I'm there and I'm in the desert and I'm in a secret chamber. Believe them not. When the Lord comes back, you're going to know he was here. You hear me? You're going to know that he was here. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Amen. We know how swift lightning is. By the time you realize that it's even appeared, it's gone. Amen. And that's what's going to happen with the return of the Lord. Say, now, Brother Mar, why'd you go through all that talking about the return of the Lord and all this? I'll tell you why. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death, or ye, ye do remember the Lord's death, till ye die. Do you realize today that every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that we ought to do so in anticipation of His return? Oh, hallelujah. Are you hearing me now? Every time we break bread and we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the Lord said, you only do this. Uh, Paul said, you're only going to do this until he comes. When he comes, this will all be put away. You'll never be pouring the grape juice again. You'll never be breaking the crackers again. It's all going to be finished. you hear me now? Oh, friend, I want you to know the promise that is attached to communion. You know, we look at communion a lot of times and all we really think about is the, the concept of the, the blood and the body and, you know, what the Lord did in that regard. But communion is not only to remind us of the price that's paid, but it's also to remind us that there is a redemption day coming. Did you hear me? When you pay a price for something, at some point you're going to go pick it up. <laughs> oh, hallelujah! I used to sell cars. People come in and they'd pick one out and they'd fall in love with it and oh it was well and they just could they were so happy oh and they'd give me a big check, you know, and boy we'd write up the paperwork and then they'd go home. What happened? They'd go home. Well, they had to call their credit union, they had to call the bank, they had to make some arrangements, they had to do this, they had to do that. But you know what? That car was there. 
We put a soul sign on it at the car dealer. You hear me now? That car was theirs. And they'd go and they'd tell their friends and their neighbors, hey, I bought me a new car today. Well, where is it? It's at the dealer. Hadn't picked it up yet. But Tommy, when you buy something, eventually you've got to go get it. Communion, oh, mm, hallelujah. Communion is not just to remind us that the Lord God but it's to remind us that he's coming to get us. <laughs> Hallelujah! Do you hear what I'm telling you today? It's a celebration of not only what he's done, but it's a celebration of what he's going to do. Hallelujah! All oh, glory! It's thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for the body. But, oh, thank God that because of this blood and this body, I'll be able to give my blood and my body up one day. Hallelujah! And I won't need it anymore. And this corruption shall put on incorruption. And this mortality shall put on immortality. Glory to God. Woo! Is that all right now? I know this is real sedate tonight. I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm going to be... <laughs> I'll be real honest with you. Today was a very tiring day for me. Uh, Tommy and I had a lot to do. And between services, I wasn't able to rest or anything. So I'm kind of real low energy tonight. But I hope... <laughs> But I hope that in spite of that, what I wanted tonight to do was if I wanted to be instructional. I wasn't really trying to preach hard. I, I just was trying to instruct them. Because, folks, you need to understand, there's a lot of false prophets out there. There's a lot of false teaching out there. There's a lot of garbage out there today. And it's all what the Lord said was going to happen. And we've got to uh, tell people, listen, if you're going to be part of my church, you better be committed to one thing, truth. Because that's what this preacher's committed to. If any foolishness comes down the pike, you're going to find me coming along and, and saying, uh-uh, this don't fly with me. I'll give you one quick example, and, I, and I'm afraid I'm going to hurt somebody's feelings. But don't let your feelings be hurt. Just listen to what I'm telling you. There's a movement come in the charismatic churches over the last few years. I think it's about the stupidest thing I've ever seen. God wants to restore your joy. The sign of your joy having been restored is you start to laugh like a hyena. Now, does Brother Morrow believe? <laughs> have I ever seen somebody laugh in the spirit? Oh, yeah. I have. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. And there are times that your heart is so broken that, you know, you don't know which end to turn. And God will put a, a laughter in your spirit, and you just start to laugh. And he, your tears are streaming down your face, and you're laughing. And I remember my grandmother, Belle, doing it. I never heard, yeah, she'd get into, she'd get into a, and she'd just start laughing. Couldn't talk, couldn't do nothing, because she was laughing so hard. And tears just streaming down her face. And she might be going through some of the worst trials of her life. But the Lord just put that in her and kind of relieved all that tension in her body. And, you know, you see, so do I believe in laughing in the Spirit? Absolutely. What I don't believe in is going into churches and preaching it wholesale and trying to sell it to everybody. And, oh, you need to experience this, and you need to experience this, and you need to experience this, and you need to experience this. No, if they need to experience it, God will give it to them. This, I mean, there were preachers going around literally trying to get entire churches into this laughing routine. And then I'm seeing on TV where these preachers are preaching, and you got some knucklehead idiot in the congregation. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, if these people had any clue how stupid they look, I'm a Holy Ghost fiddle, born again, child of God, and I still think they look like a pal idiot. You know, God doesn't do things just to make people look foolish. The Lord, you know, when I was a member of the Riverside Church of God, I've never, different people get blessed in different ways. 
I remember different times being folks get wet and they shout and they 